guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today, Mark Ellis. Welcome one and all to the best movie news show in the galaxy. My name is Mark, and I want to thank everybody that came out to see me do stand-up in Boston this weekend. So many Collider fans, one of whom brought me a Star Wars lunchbox. Oh, nice. I got a Star Wars lunchbox from a fan, so now I have somewhere to put my balloon and my Magic the Gathering cards. <laughs> Ashley, who is joining us on the panel today? Also here, Dennis Zen. Hey, guys. I hope you guys had a great weekend. I want to apologize. We did try to do the Collider Q&A thing last Friday. I accidentally posted on my own Facebook you page. You attention whore. I know. I did that on purpose. <laughs> okay. But anyways, so we're going to try and do it again after tonight's show, if I can figure, or not tonight, today's show, after I, if I can figure out what's going on with my But phone. also, check out Dennis on Facebook. Yeah. I'm sure it's worth it. <laughs> also here, Clark Wall. <laughs> hey, guys. Nice to see you. And thank you all so much for watching the premiere episode of Collider Nightmares. I'm so proud of the show, and I'm really, you guys turned out, so thank you. Yeah, New episode tomorrow. New episode tomorrow. I can't wait. Crushing on the YouTube channel right now on Collider Video YouTube, which is where you're watching this, so go ahead and subscribe. And if you have ever hung out with Collider at all, whether online or in person, get ready to enter the most kick-ass contest we've ever done. That would be your chance to win a trip to Comic-Con this year. You're going to win two badges to Comic-Con, two airfares, two hotel accommodations, and you're going to get some spending money to buy me food or whatever <laughs> else you want to do with that. So make sure you guys check out all the details. The link is in the description of this vid, or you can head over to Collider.com. Con. Everybody who I met in Boston this weekend after the shows, all, they only had one thing on their mind. They're like, hey, how can I get an in into winning this contest to go to San Diego? And I might have made some promises. I can't keep any of them. I have no and idea. And you took how a bunch of money this. from them. I was them about too. to say, you got a lunchbox full of cash. I am taking us to Wood Ranch after the show. Oh, by the way, happy grand opening. Wood Ranch in Burbank. <laughs> okay, Ash, what's our first story of the day? It's Monday, which means it's time for the weekend box office report brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. It was a packed weekend of new releases, and it was The Conjuring 2 that came out on top. The horror sequel from James Wan dominated the weekend box office with an impressive $40.4 million for the number one spot, nearly matching the first Conjuring's $41.9 million debut. Conjuring 2 easily beat the other two releases, Now You See Me 2 and Warcraft, with Legendary Universal's War World of Warcraft adaptation taking the number two spot with 24.4 million. Warcraft's domestic debut would have been worrisome given the video game's adaptation's 160 million production budget, plus the million spent in marketing the film. Was it not for China's box office earning an amazing 156 million over its first four days overseas? Lionsgate's Now You See Me 2 took the number three spot, debuting to 23 million. In the number four spot was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Out of the Shadows, taking in 14.8 million in its second weekend in release. And in the number five spot was X-Men Apocalypse with 10 million, bringing its domestic total to $136.4 million. Mark, thoughts on The Conjuring 2's huge weekend at the box office? Well, let's well, because look, I didn't love it as much as I loved the first Conjuring. I thought the first Conjuring was like a great film and The Conjuring 2 was a really cool horror movie, but clearly the, the built-in name brand appeal of The Conjuring, plus the fact that every summer we get a horror movie or two that opens strongly, hopefully we get another one later this summer, I think that's good news if you are a horror fan, which I know, Clark, you certainly are. I also want to touch on Warcraft because just looking at the $24 million number, I'm like... God, that looks horrible. And then you look at what it did in China. Holy crap. Just to give you guys some perspective, I think The Force Awakens, its entire run in China was just over $100 million, maybe like around 120, 125. Warcraft beat that in three days. So it's like, yeah, it didn't do great here, but hopefully because of how well it did in China, we get another couple Warcraft movies. And I maybe people didn't hate Warcraft. It wasn't that well received here. People enjoyed it okay. Dennis, I know you liked Warcraft, mm. so you want to see more stories told in this universe. So let me go to you first. Do you think that the domestic box office is going to hurt the sequel chances for Warcraft or the fact that it's just annihilating overseas? We're going to get more of these. I mean, we're, we have to see what happens in China in, in the following weeks, but mm -hmm. if it continues to make as much money as it does, then it almost, may, almost makes the North American box office numbers irrelevant, which happened kind of with Pacific Rim. I mean, even Pacific Rim made, I think, eventually $100 million domestically, but definitely China's 
box office made it so that they could green light a sequel and and this is might be the case i mean china alone might be able to get this movie another one and maybe maybe even a trilogy and i think with legendary legendary is now owned by china mm -hmm. uh, a chinese company and they they planted i think the marketing seeds a long time ago there's also a dedicated fan base for the game in china so I guess it's not as surprising, and people have to remember Star Wars over there isn't the big phenomenon that it is over here. Oh, absolutely, yeah, and and you have to remember too. As much as we love thinking, oh well, the North American box office—that's what really counts. Not, nah, dude, money talks, <laughs> and money is the exact same in China <laughs> as it is here. You got to go through some conversions, but once it gets in your bank account, you're just as happy. So, Clark, let's go back to the Conjuring for a little yeah. bit. I know that you like the Conjuring too, yep. like I did. Did you expect to see it do as well as it did this weekend? I did, and I was glad that it did you know something especially when you're talking about genre movies and horror um, is audience reaction so not only was the conjuring 2 well received by critics it is fresh on rotten tomatoes it wasn't as solid of a review as the first film but the cinema score was the same it was an a minus that I can't underscore how much that does not happen with horror movies. So for whatever reasons, whether the critics respond to it or not, um, the Conjuring franchise is well reviewed and well received by its fans. And at the end of the day, that is the important thing. And the other thing I wanted to mention, which is also super impressive for the Conjuring, once again, R-rated movie. An R-rated movie crushed the box office like this wasn't a 10 million dollar difference there was no competition it, it, there didn't end up being competition this weekend so I think that that is a huge sign but I also think it's a testament to the name recognition like you were saying but also James Wan I think audiences after his fast movie after um, you know his conjuring films after insidious they recognize him and they know if he's involved they're probably going to get something quality yeah I'm I'm really curious to see what what Warcraft does from here on out because like, like with the country you know it's gonna it, it's probably gonna open big and then we expect at least a 50 percent drop off next weekend horror movies generally make a lot of their money on opening weekend but warcraft might be one of those things where it keeps making mm -hmm. some money obviously overseas but also here i don't think that's going to be the case with now you see me too i think that's a, where if you wanted to see that movie you checked it out opening weekend and i don't expect it to be hanging around that long i personally was disappointed by the movie I thought it could have been another really fun cable TV kind of watch and it just it really wasn't the case. Yeah, that's what I was I was was going to add. You know, I feel like with these top 3, these films because for me when I was looking at opening weekend, I was like, wow, that's a lot of heavy hitters coming out in one weekend. However, I think each one of these top 3 has had very different strategies. I think if I'm being honest, Legendary was not expecting Warcraft to do well here in the US, but I do think they were counting on it doing well overseas and that's what happened. Same with The Conjuring. I think they were looking for a big opening weekend. Word of mouth will hopefully be positive and that will keep it in the top five for a little while. But now you see me, now you see me, the first film made its uh, overall money at, on home video mm -hmm. and at home. Now granted, it had a pretty solid and comparable um, opening to Now You See Me Too. And it stuck around slowly but surely, you know, making its money, but it was at home. And I think that I was reading this morning, one of the Lionsgate executives was saying like look I, we're hoping for the same thing that happened the first one people are going to watch it on vod which it's fascinating in terms of release strategy absolutely yeah you made a great point right before we went to air about sequels and how generally when you release a sequel it you expect it to not do as well as the first one but i guess the fact that now you see me too did almost what the first one yep. did and the conjuring 2 did almost what the first one did that bodes pretty well absolutely okay ash what's our next door the first teaser trailer <clears throat> excuse me for disney's animated adventure moana was released online giving fans a first look at the animated musical that stars dwayne the rock john Johnson. Directed by Ron Clements and John Musker, the duo behind The Little Mermaid and Aladdin, the film revolves around Moana, a spirited teenage girl who sets sail to prove herself a master sailor and fulfill her ancestors' unfinished quest with Maui, voiced by Johnson in tow. The movie features original songs by Hamilton's Lin-Manuel Miranda, along with the voice talents of The Rock, Alan Tudyk, and newcomer Ali Cravalho. Moana opens in theaters on November 23rd. Dennis, what, do you, what did you think of the first teaser for Disney's Moana. Uh, I mean, I thought it was cute. They didn't have too much. And we were debating here whether or not we were going to do a reaction or review video to it. But after seeing it, I was like, there isn't that much to it. You have the little campfire story in the beginning, and then you get shots of the actual movie. We, uh, 
I don't know what the story exactly is yet, but I'm excited just because of The Rock's involvement. We talked about the the, the teaser poster last week and how The Rock is an empire unto himself. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a solid teaser for what it's doing. The movie doesn't come out until November, so it announces that there is a new movie, a Disney movie called Moana, so you know it's going to be like something that a lot of kids want to see, and hopefully adults as well. When I first heard about this movie, I was at D23. You were not there no. yet. I don't know, Clark, if you were around nope. D23, but Christian and I were in there, and it was a fun thing. It was a nice presentation. They had The Rock came out on stage, which is just the guy's huge in person. Person. like he's his personality overtakes a room and then he's got some pretty big biceps on top of that and when he mm -hmm. talked about this movie you could see the passion that he was going to bring to this and what intrigued me the most is that when they showed some footage more footage than we got here is they mentioned how water is a character mm -hmm. in this movie and it really ties into the Hawaiian culture very nicely so you get a little bit of those feels from this trailer but there wasn't too much but I enjoyed watching it how about you Clark? Yeah I really liked it and one of the biggest takeaways for me was just how beautiful it looks. Yeah. I mean, the colors are so rich and I've never been to Hawaii, but that's sort of what I always imagined Hawaii to look like, just in pure and gorgeous colors. So I'm very excited about that. The other thing I wanted to mention is these two gentlemen who directed this movie also did The Princess and the Frog, which is one of my favorite animated Disney movies ever. Um, I think it's really, really great. And uh, and so I, I'm excited for them to be on this project as well. And uh, I thought this t first teaser it was really promising. I hear nothing but good things about the princess and the frog. Oh, is that so a, uh, good. Is that yeah, like a, you it. kiss a frog and he turns into a prince story? Well, is that what that is? It is, the, it is the frog prince story to an extent, but it takes place in New Orleans in the early 1900s. It, there's it, a lot of frogs there. There, there are a lot of frogs, <laughs> and there's there's elements of voodoo and food. And I mean, I'm you're, we're both Southern, but I yeah. spent a lot of time in New Orleans and still do whenever I can. It's such an incredible city. And um, so that culture and that feel, it, it really, they, the music is fabulous. I Go watch Princess and the Frog and then get excited for Moana. Wow, frogs and beignets. That sounds <laughs> yeah. awesome. What more could you want? Well, speaking of music, you know, they have uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda right. doing the music. He just won a bunch of Tonys last night for Hamilton. So I think that's going to help sell the movie as well. And he is um, attached to the new Mary Poppins movie. So working with he's part of the Disney family now. They've got him. The new, the new Mary Poppins movie. That you, is, cannot, you, yeah. that you Clyder, cannot wait You know for I'm it. over the moon about that. <laughs> that Mark got booed, booed from the, the peanut gallery, too. I don't hate Mary Poppins. I'm just not like, lining up to see a sequel or a reimagining just yet. Ashley, did you get a chance to check out the Moana trailer? I did. And it have was you really seen cute. Princess and the Frog? I haven't seen Princess and the Frog, oh, but man. now that, with your description, now I have to see it. It's great. But I thought this teaser was really cute. My one complaint is I wish it was a little bit longer, but I do like this rundown. I like that there's a story there. But again, I have to remember that it's just a teaser. So I'm excited for the tra the full trailer to come out. It really did make me, every time I see anything, whether it's this, the Descendants or whether it's this new trailer, like it just made me want to go back to Hawaii. So if I'm going to show up tomorrow, you know where I am. <laughs> okay, what's our next story? According to a report from the Daily Mail, Angelina Jolie is in early talks to take on Fox's remake of Murderer on the Orient Express. Fellow actor-director Kenneth Branagh is helming the movie in addition to starring as Hercule Poirot, the fictional Belgian detective and most famous character created by author Agatha Christie. Mm -hmm. Blade Runner 2's Michael Green is writing a screenplay based on the Christie novel that tells the story of a murderer on board the famous train with Detective Poirot Road tasked with solving the case, in which a number of passengers could potentially be the murderer. The Fox Project is a remake of Sidney Lumet's 1974 movie, which starred Albert Finney as the genius detective investigating the murder of an American tycoon aboard the train. A release date has yet to be set. Clark, what do you think of a murder on the Orient Express remake with Angelina Jolie? I really like this i like this a lot i um i i would i first of all with kenneth branagh you know i was so impressed with his work on uh, cinderella of all things um but i i had no expectations for that movie and wound up loving it and and when i got a chance to speak with him about the film I found, I mean, I know he's he's known as a force and a powerhouse in film and television and theater, but I found him to be really kind and open and, and really smart. So the point I'm making is that I love this idea of a classic story, um, and but with a little edge to it. And my hope for this, my big hope for this, is that they keep it, period. I don't want to see an updated version of this, especially considering the train element. It would be kind of 
may be hard to do. But um, I also like the idea of, you know, I'm not a huge Angelina Jolie fan, but I think that she picks her movies very selectively. And most of the time, they're projects that, you know, she comes out swinging for. So I, I like this a lot. Yeah, I mean, recently, you, you could be forgiven for feeling nervous about Angelina Jolie in this movie because you think of, like, The Tourist or you think of, you know, what, what that one she did with Brad Pitt, which I didn't hate. Super, but it's, super depressing yeah, movie. Yeah, it was just kind of like you're just hanging out in a room with a couple that hates each other for two hours. Sounds just, like fun. It's not my idea of a good time. I'd rather see princesses making out with frogs in the South. But with this particular story, I think Angelina is going to be great in it if she decides to actually take on the project. And like you said, Clark, I'm already excited about this thing. I'm sure they're going to get talent involved, whether it's Angelina Jolie or not. But Kenneth Branagh directing this thing and starring in it, we've seen from Cinderella, mm -hmm. from Thor, from all the Shakespearean stuff, is that this guy will take source material and cater to those fans, but also really appreciate what it is and get something out of it so the, the it's based on the the hugely popular agatha christie story and the who done it as far as that genre she may be the best ever at that so when you're adapting that i don't know if it needs to be kept period i think i'd probably rather see it like that mm. but if they say oh it's going to take place in modern day i'm not gonna you know it's I think I would rather see a period than not think about it because all the modern technology yeah. it's just it, it's they'd just, be on their cell phones the whole yeah, time it's not as fun yeah. you know Albert Finney is no easy guy to replace I think Kenneth Branagh's up to it and I think that Angelina Jolie would be a credit to this movie how about you Dennis well we, we aren't buying or selling yet but this mm -hmm. would be a big buy for me I, I love mystery movies I used to read a lot of Ag Agatha Christie and the original Sidney Lumet one they put a lot of talent behind it. They had Sean Connery was in it, Lauren Bacall, mm -hmm. Ingrid Bergman. So it wasn't one of those kind of cheap movies that they're like, oh, let's just uh, tap into the fan base and, and just get this thing out there. And that's what it looks like they're doing with this one, with Angelina Jolie. And then especially with Kenneth Braun, I think this is in his wheelhouse, and I think he's going to do a fantastic job with it. So I'm actually really excited. It's a, just a really great title, Murder on the Orient Express. Yeah. It just it, it sounds intriguing. So hopefully we get a good movie out of it. Uh, like Dennis alluded to, now we will move on to Buy or Sell. This is the part of the show. You know what? Hang on just a second. <laughs> Wendy, don't let me leave you out again. Let's talk about what's going on in the main topics in the chat room. First of all, what are the fans saying about the box office? And then how about our other stories? as well. All right, here we go with the box office. A lot of the Alcor. chat, hey dog, a lot of the chat says that they knew The Conjuring 2 would do well, and some say they can't believe that Warcraft didn't make more in the U.S., but at least it did well overseas. For the first trailer for Moana, uh, a lot of the chat is liking the teaser trailer, saying they're excited to see this. Mega Iron Man 98 says, Moana looks great, the animation looks stunning, and the character from The Rock looks awesome. I can't wait. And finally, for the Angelina Jolie, a uh, remake of the murder on the Orient Express. Seems like the chat is quite divided on this. Some like Angelina Jolie, other things the casting choice just okay. Uh, Shayad says, Angelina Jolie is no guarantee that the movie will be good. And Jonathan Caro says, what, why, why another remake of a good movie? Wow, you know, Falcor really chews up scenery. <laughs> like, like, like I got bits and pieces of what the commenters were saying, but more so it's just like that dog. Is, look at that. Look at how cute that puppy is. Oh, that is Falcor. unbelievable. One day he will grow to be as tall as a building and fly all over the place <laughs> in a faraway land. Now let's move on to buy or sell. This is the part of the show where Ashley is going to give us at the panel a topic, and we'll say whether we buy it or sell it, and then maybe throw some elbows defending our choice. What's up first? The first images from Wolverine 3 have been released online, giving fans their first good look at a sort of X-Men reunion with Hugh Jackman's Wolverine featured alongside Patrick Stewart's Professor X. Word has been very quiet in regards to the plot on this untitled Wolverine sequel, which has been rumored to be titled Weapon X and said to be following the old man Logan storyline. The Wolverine Helmer James Mangold returns to direct Wolverine 3, which also stars Richard E. Grant, Stephen Merchant, and Eric LaSalle. It will open in theaters on March 3, 2017. Mark Byers saw the first images from the set of Wolverine 3. Oh, it's a huge buy for me. I love the way that an older Wolverine looks, an older Professor X looks, him helping him out. My first thought when I read this story was Eric LaSalle's in this movie? Sweet. All right. Good news. Going back to the pictures. Yeah, they look great. It's what I would want to see an older Wolverine, an older Hugh Jackman look like the aging process that they put on him. If this is any indication as to how it's going to look on screen, it looks very natural. It does not look fake. Sometimes when you try to age actors too much, it just comes off as creepy and cheesy like they're wearing a Halloween mask. That's not going to be the case with Wolverine 3. I'm very excited by these images. 
and I buy them. How about you? Yeah, I'll buy them too. Uh, I, you know, it's funny because Hugh Jackman is close to 50. He's pushing 50. Yeah, yeah so I, I, it's maybe it's less that they're aging him up and more like they're just not aging him down for this. <laughs> That's actually what 50 year olds on. look like, kids. <laughs> Believe it or not, <laughs> even gorgeous ones like Hugh Jackman. Um, I buy them. I buy seeing uh, Hugh Jackman and um, and Patrick Stewart together in, in the same in the same place again. I'm very curious about this story. And also, whereas I did not like The Rock's facial hair in his uh, solo uh, fast movie, Hobbs movie, I am digging Hugh Jackman's facial hair. That is a beard. That is a man. That, that is, is a man beard. A full beard. He looks like the before <laughs> in a Just For Men like commercial. But it's 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 what I want to see from Old Man Logan. I'm not familiar with the comic book storyline that much, but if that's if if we're taking this guy and this is what he looks like in this movie, you got to be excited about this, right, Dennis? Yeah, I, I'm buying this. It, it does. I think that this movie is going to do kind of what Days of Future Past is: capture mm -hmm. the spirit of the comic book storyline, but it's not going to copy it uh, like page by page, frame by frame. Especially given looking at these pictures, he doesn't have quite the same look as Old Man Logan does in the comic book. And not only right. that, the clothing and and the the location that I can see from these pictures make it look less of a post-apocalyptic type of story and more of maybe maybe it's a dystopian type of movie, which is a lot different because the environment wouldn't be like this where they've got cars and they're wearing like regular clothing. The, the, the comic book was more like a, a futurist, uh, futuristic Western. So uh, that, that's it, what's interesting to me. I wish they had shown pictures of just the entire set as well. Yeah, well, I'm sure we're going to get those eventually. The movie does come out. Well, we're not that far away from actually getting to see this movie in theaters, which is very exciting to me. And you might be a little sad because it's the last time we're going to see Wolfried on screen, probably played by Hugh Jackman. We'll have to find out. Okay, what's up next? Warner Brothers PG-13 rated Suicide Squad adaptation is less than two months away from opening, and now the marketing team has released two new TV spots to get the fans excited. Writer-director David Ayer and his cast aims to make this anti-hero outing the best of the best in a year crowded with super-powered cinema. Suicide Squad stars Will Smith, Margot Robbie, Jared Leto, Viola Davis, Jai Courtney, Jay Hernandez, Cara Delevingne, and Karen Fukuhara, and opens in theaters in 2D, 3D, and IMAX 3D on August. August 5th. Dennis, buy or sell the two new TV spots for Suicide Squad. I buy them. They follow the kind of the same spirit and tone and look and feel of the, uh, the last trailer. And I've liked all of the trailers and TV spots that they've had so far. You know, there's all this talk about the reshoots, and I know reshoots are normal for big budget films. However, I've heard rumblings, and, and this isn't just what Finstock has said, but from <laughs> other people. Jim Sock is Yeah, Jim Sock. Yeah. Um, I've heard from other people that there are indications that these reshoots are more extensive than, than people <clears throat> think. And that, that, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, may, you know, you see some smoke, there might be some fire there. These TV spots have a tall order because not only do they have to get fans who aren't necessarily in our movie news space as much excited about Suicide Squad, but for us watching it, these people, the panel, they also have to put out of our mind the fact that we do hear all these things about reshoots and re-edits and recuts and all those things. And they managed to do it yet again. Every time I actually see something on TV or in a movie theater, a trailer for Suicide Squad, I'm like, yes, this is exactly the movie I want to see. It's the exact tone. It's the exact look. These are characters that I want to get to know better. I want to see what kind of mission they're on. And oh, by the way, we get some Joker and some Batman in this movie, too. So everything I've seen from this movie that they've actually put out in the public looks great. And these TV spots are the latest example of that. So I am still over the moon about Suicide Squad, regardless of what I hear from my friends or stuff I see on Twitter. I cannot wait to see this movie, and I think it's going to be great. Did I say the same thing about Batman v Superman? Of course I did. So I was a little let down by that movie. Hopefully the same thing won't happen for Suicide Squad. I buy these TV spots wholeheartedly. How about you? All right, so I'm going to switch it up. I'm going to both buy and sell them. Ooh. And the reason is because uh, there are two spots that, that we're talking about in particular. One is still cut to Bohemian Rhapsody. Mm -hmm. The other is not. I am not feeling Bohemian Rhapsody one, which is a little, I don't know if goofy is the right word for me, but it's just, there's something about it that's not landing. Plus, 
Uh, we've all seen that Bohemian Rhapsody trailer months ago. So I kind of like the idea of shaking it up a little bit. Um, and the tone is a little comical for me in that particular trailer. So I sell that one. However, the other one, I totally buy that one. The, if the fact that I can be of two minds of it, it's, it's very interesting because I wonder how their marketing seems a little confused to me. Like they're trying to say, oh, maybe it's fun and goofy. Oh, but also maybe it's dark and, and you know, serious and, and there's Batman, so don't forget. And it's like, it's a confused message to me. So that's what I'd say. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want it to be so fun and goofy that it turns into like a Joel Schumacher Batman Forever situation, but I also don't need it just to be dark and gritty like we, like has been the complaint with some other DCU properties. So I'm happy that it does have this other tone to it. And that's the way I took it, though I can understand people seeing the Bohemian Rhapsody in there and it's just not working as well for them as it might have in that first trailer that right. we got to see where we got to hear more of this song and we got to see more of what the movie was about. But ever since I saw this movie uh, or I saw a little bit of a clip of it at Comic-Con last year, it was on my radar and one of my most anticipated for this year. That's kind of what Comic-Con is good at doing. So that lends itself to our next story, which we might get some cool stuff at Comic-Con from a different comic book property. What's up, Ash? After taking 2015 off, it's looking like Marvel Studios could be returning to San Diego Comic-Con this year. While the studio is holding off from any official announcement regarding a Hall H appearance, Doctor Strange director Scott Derrickson and Guardians of the Galaxy director James Gunn took to Twitter to drop a couple unsettled hints about a Marvel presence this year, with Derrickson tweeting an image of a Doctor Strange banner saying, will I be a comic Con this year, here's a hint. James Gunn replied to his tweet saying, you'll be so close, I might have to come see you. The Disney-owned <laughs> studio skipped the, studio, the show last year, more than likely in order to show footage of their own D23 convention <sighs> the following month. With no D23 convention this year, it appears Comic-Con will be the best place to unveil new Doctor Strange footage ahead of the movie's November's November release, with both Thor Ragnarok and Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 currently in production and expected to have a showing at the convention. San Diego Comic-Con runs July 21st to, through the 24th at the San Diego Convention Center. Clark, buyers sell a Marvel presence at this year's Comic-Con. Yeah, I buy it for sure. And honestly, I don't know about you guys, but I thought that Disney was like done, done with Comic-Con. So I'm actually a little surprised that they could potentially be coming out with these two titles, which are major titles for them. Um, and for me, I've said it before, I will say it again, Guardians is my favorite of all the Marvel movies. I love it. I'm very excited to see more and hear more for Guardians Volume 2. And, um, you know, and as far as Doctor Strange, I know a lot of people are excited for that as well. So I, I buy it for sure. Oh, yeah. It means that I hope this winning smile gets me back in the Hall H <laughs> again this year. I'm going to cram as many Cliff Bars as I can into that new Star Wars lunchbox I have, and I will be ready for all of this Marvel footage that I think we're going to see. And if you love seeing Marvel and Disney footage at Comic-Con, you better get a chance to do it this year because I don't know if you're going to continue to have that opportunity because like Clark brought up, D23 is something that now they're going to stack it right next to Comic-Con next year. So why would they want to bring any additional footage the next week or the week prior to San Diego? But this year, it's going to be different. You are going to see Guardians footage, Guardians 2 footage. You are going to see Doctor Strange and hopefully some Thor Ragnarok stuff as well because that movie is right around the corner. I don't know what order they're going to do it in. I think Thor Ragnarok would get the biggest, uh, if, they, if you see Hulk in that Thor movie, I think that's going to get the biggest push if the effects are ready yet. But all of these movies I'm very excited about. And let's not forget, when Guardians of the Galaxy, the first one was coming out, they had footage. They had a full trailer to show that they surprised fans with at Comic-Con in Hall H. And they'd only been shooting it for two weeks. We know from tweets and Instagrams that we've seen this movie's been in production for a while now. So I think we're going to get some very, very exciting stuff from Marvel and maybe some other Disney properties. Hence my launch box coming out <laughs> at Comic-Con this summer. How do you feel about this, Dennis? Yeah, I buy it as well. It totally makes sense, especially given with what Doctor Strange is. And we all know what Doctor Strange is and some of the, the hardcore comic book fans. But we have to remember the casual fans, the movie going fans that, that don't know about it. Not that they're going to be at Comic-Con, but a lot of them pay attention to Comic-Con news. They, they hear what the buzz is. And so if, if Marvel brings... Doctor Strange to Comic Con and can get that buzz going. Mm -hmm. That will spread out. It's 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 like all your friends on your Facebook feed. Not all of them are this into like movies or comic book movies, but they always see your feed whenever you post a trailer or a news thing. 
and they start to get interested in it as well. And so I think Marvel wants to get that with Doctor Strange, but you guys are right. Next year with D23 being so close to Comic-Con, it's very unlikely that they're going to show up. That's right. And I also, I, I hope that Hall H comes to play. And what I mean by that is I hope that the security is good there. I hope that they're like, hey, this is footage that we're only showing at Comic-Con and hopefully we don't see leaks. Because even if you aren't allowed to be in Comic-Con or you can't make it to Hall H or whatever, you don't win our contest and you're not going to be on site, nobody wants to see this stuff for the first time pirated. Even if you do watch it pirated, which I'm sure a lot of people will if they get the opportunity, it's not how you want to experience it the first time. Hopefully Hopefully the hallway security really comes to play here because there's going to be a lot of cool stuff that Marvel's showing that they may not want to get out into the world just yet. Okay, Ash, we got one more buy or we sell. Do. Let's do it. According to a report from THR, Edge of Tomorrow director Doug Lyman is in talks to tackle Lionsgate Summit's post-apocalyptic YA thriller Chaos Walking based on the Patrick Ness novel of the same name. Oscar-winning screenwriter of Adaptation and Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, Charlie Kaufman, is penning the screenplay along with Money Monsters' Jamie Linden. The story takes place in a world devoid of women where all living creatures can hear one another's thoughts in a stream of images, words, and sounds called noise. When a young boy suddenly stumbles upon a silent young girl, the two set off on a dangerous journey full of twists and turns. With Lyman now on board for the Chaos Walking adaptation, some new questions have risen about his attachment to the long and development Gambit adaptation at Fox and whether or not he will have the time to make the movie with all these other projects in development. There is no current release date set for Chaos Walking. Mark, buy or sell a Chaos Walking adaptation with Doug Lyman. I buy it. I mean, I like having the town of Doug Doug Lyman and Charlie Kaufman involved in something like this. And that, that that premise sounds horrifying. It's a world where there's no women. Pretty much my life from 2003 <laughs> to 2013. But in addition to that loneliness, you also can see everybody else's thoughts or you have just all this noise that apparently it's very hard to block out. Then all of a sudden you find a young girl and it's like, oh boy, this is going to get interesting. Yeah, I'm locked into that premise. I'm not that bummed reading that because of this or some other projects, Doug Wyman may not be able. It just doesn't seem like Gambit is that is on the forefront of everybody's mind right now. And I'm cool with that. I, I was excited to see a new take on Gambit, but I don't need it. And I like seeing more original feeling stories, and that's what this is. So if I can trade out, if I had to trade a superhero <coughs> for something that's original sounding is what this does, then I think Gambit's the guy, you know what, Gambit here, I'll give you, I, I'll, I'll check you out in a few years whenever you finally get made because it's going to happen eventually. But Chaos Walking, yeah, I think I would like to check that out. I'll buy it. How about you, Clark? Yeah, I buy it too, although I, I'm, I'm cautious. So first of all, I think Lyman and Kaufman sound like they are perfect uh, components for this particular story. You know, I feel like this crazy dystopian kind of future like Edge of Tomorrow makes sense for this story, uh, for this adaptation. And Charlie Kaufman, I think his sensibilities are in line with this too. The only thing that sort of give me, gives me pause is, I believe it's a Lionsgate film um, and it's a YA adaptation and mm -hmm. they're just really trying to push this YA thing as far as they can. And I think we're sort of seeing that maybe audiences are waning on that a little bit. I'm not saying there's anything inherently wrong with YA, but it kind of feels like a little late to the to the party of the YA adaptations. Um, but as I said earlier, the talent involved really, really spectacular. And I think the premise sounds interesting. So I, I cautiously buy it. We got two buys, Dennis. Are we going for three? Uh, yeah, I'm not as sold on the concept as you guys are. But because of Doug Lyman, because of Charlie Kaufman, that's the reason that I buy. I think Lyman is an underrated director. He got to start directing Swingers with John Favreau and Vince Vaughn. People forget that he directed the first Born Identity because mm -hmm. Paul Greengrass is now so associated with that franchise. I even like Mr. and Mrs. Smith, and I think most people loved uh, Edge of Tomorrow. Yeah, most of, most of the talk around this, though, is, is the Gambit movie ever going to get done? And is Doug Lyman still going to be uh, attached? Because they had, uh, was it Rupert Wyatt was attached mm -hmm. first? Mm -hmm. He left, they brought on Doug Lyman, and then they delayed it again. <laughs> and he's just been trying to pick up projects left and right. So. By the time they decide to do Gambit, he may not be available. And I would have liked to have seen Doug Lyman's take on Gambit, but it just doesn't seem like something with all of the comic book movies that were spoiled with that I needed to see a Gambit movie directed by anybody, including Doug Lyman. Are you heartbroken that this might push back when we do finally get to see a new version of Gambit? 
Uh, I'm not heartbroken just because with Gambit, I, I had hoped that they would have introduced him into the X-Men movie universe first in one of the, the films and then maybe done a spinoff. Also, even though I like Channing Tatum, I don't see him as a fit for the Gambit character. So that's another reason why I'm just not that excited for it. Yeah, Clark, let me get your take. Gambit, do we need to see that movie sooner rather than later? Or should we get different kind of things, particularly from Doug Lyman? I hate to say this, but I don't think Fox is particularly interested in going down this road, um, especially considering the the moderate performance of um, Apocalypse. I don't know if Fox really knows what they're doing with their fr bigger franchise right now. Mm -hmm. They clearly know that Deadpool worked for them, uh, but again, totally out of left field, I would say. Um, and As in nobody except for the Oracle, John Schnepp predicted <laughs> the, those types of returns. Um, and then of course, you know, you have Wolverine on his way out, allegedly. Um, and then, you know, as I said, Apocalypse Apocalypse underperformed by Fox's standards, I would say, critically and monetarily. So I don't think Gambit's going to happen unless for some reason the X-Men franchise gets another shot in the arm and they take that as an opportunity to introduce the next line of uh, X-Men characters and potential, potentially solo films. Okay, well, let's see what Wendy and Falcor have to say about this now. <laughs> we go back to the chat room. I bought everything in today's show. Wendy, were the fans out there acting like Daddy Warbucks or were they a little <laughs> more cautious with their money? Well, they're actually pretty generous today for the Wolverine 3 images. Uh, the chat buys this and they buy the beard, but not everyone is uh, as excited about these images. Ed Investor says, this is nothing like Old Man Logan, and DH says, I can't buy these images without the context, t context of its story. For the Suicide Squad TV spots, a lot of the chat buys it as well. Most of them are just excited for this movie in general, and Wouter De Bruin says, I think they just want us to know they are bad guys. They only say it in every single spot. <laughs> <laughs> for the Guardians of the Galaxy and Doctor Strange at SDCC, um, they're buying this as well. Brian uh, Lefebvre says, new Doctor Strange trailer better be at Comic-Con. And Shayad says, Doctor Strange will be a great t test case for Marvel. Can they continue their dominance with a very different kind of property? I hope so. Doug Lyman directing Chaos Walking. I am seeing both buy and sell for this. It, it just seems like some people just don't know about the, the book. Um, Broadcasting Books says these books are fantastic. And Blake says, I like Doug Lyman, but we don't need another YA post-apocalyptic thing. Okay, now we go on to Mailbag. This is the part of the show where you guys send us in your emails at any time. Collidervideo at gmail.com is the correct address to do so. And Ashley's going to read one right now. Before we get to that, I just want to remind you guys at the end of the show, we're going to take your live Twitter questions. You can tweet us at Collider Video, and maybe Ashley reads your tweet on air, just maybe. Okay, mm -hmm. what's up first in the mailbox? Alexander Chang writes, Dear Collider, love the show and watch daily since the AMC days. There has been much talk over diversity in film following the Oscars and the casting in Doctor Strange and Gods of Egypt. With the casting of Daniel Wu in Warcraft and the recent success of the film in China, could this lead to the casting of more Asian actors to cash in on the Asian box office? I would certainly hope so, and I would also certainly hope that just because a movie made a lot of money in China, that's not why people are like, fine, now we're going to put more Asian actors in movies. Like, you should do it if it honors the source material, regardless of the Doctor Strange controversy, because that seems like something that I don't necessarily, if you want to update that or you want to change it, I'm fine with that. But if you put more Asian actors in a movie, I think it's going to be a credit overall. In the culture we live in today, it's nice to see different groups of people represented in mainstream box office fair. So I love the concept of it. It's sad that sometimes it takes money to talking to get that notion across to studios, but whatever way it happens, it would be nice to see more diversity in film. Dennis, do you agree with that? Uh, I mean, I agree that they are going to probably put more Asian faces in films to appeal to, to the Asian box office, specifically China. I don't, I, you know, I'd like to believe that, oh yeah, they're going to do it because they want to have more diversity. Mm -hmm. No, they're going to do it because of money. That's the, the, the main reason why they're going to do it. However, I wouldn't count uh, Daniel Wu. I thought he did a good job as Gul'dan in Warcraft, but I wouldn't count that as him, them casting an Asian actor. You don't see him exactly. on screen. You yeah. could, it could be anyone yeah. there, but in the future, I think they will try and, I mean, look at Transformers Age of Extinction. Like they, they took the story to China and Hong Kong specifically to appeal to that market. It had no 
reason why the story went there. They just did it, and they, they cast some some Asian actors in there so they could uh, uh, get more money in China. Yeah, so if it's if it's broadening the appeal of a movie, it, it doesn't feel like the uh, you, you know the most honest thing you could possibly do just to throw somebody who looks different in there to appeal to that marketplace. But it might happen more in the future based on Warcraft's numbers. Is that how you see it, Clark? Uh, maybe, but I just you know regardless of Warcraft's numbers, the thing that I always notice is that we, you know. Uh, when you have casts that are led by, let's say, African-American actors, those movies oftentimes succeed because, in, in part, um, the African-American audience doesn't get movies that are in wide release that have people that look like them in it. I think it's the same with, I think my point is, same with Asian actors, same with women, movies that are led by women. I just think across the board, I cannot for the life of me understand why Hollywood has not looked at the money of all a rep, of all types of movies that have representation and said, hey, these audiences are X amount of our ticket buying audience or whatever the case may be. These movies, certain movies that appeal to different demographics most of the time are financially successful. There is no reason why the, it needs to be, well, this is a movie for the African-American audience. This is a movie for women. This is a movie for, no. Put them all together and hedge your bets. It's foolish from a monetary perspective. That's what you would hope for, yeah, is, is, is people actually just having, especially if you have something with a big cast that you get to have a lot of different races, a lot of different ethnicities, genders, both represented in there. That's what I would like to see. I don't know that Warcraft's success is going to be the boon to do that because I think most of Warcraft's success is still based on how big of a property it Absolutely. is in China. That people love playing Warcraft in China, and that's why it's huge there as opposed any other reasons but look you, you never know so we're gonna have to wait and see how studios react to this on multiple fronts it'll be interesting to watch it play out and now we move on to twitter questions okay ash i know we only did one mailbag today we did. did you have some time to aggregate some I really did. good twitter questions and actually just a tip guys if you want to get your question answered you should send it at the beginning of the show not wait until like mailbag happens you know it's easier to sort through at the beginning of the show so wait so, so you're so saying that there. you're saying that my announcement that we're gonna do twitter questions when does you absolutely announce, nothing there's like hundreds of people sending their questions and i'm like oh my god panic panic copy paste copy paste but at the beginning of the show it's like calm it's nice you have like 10 questions questions to pick <laughs> from and those pe people always get their question picked okay well so there's a tip right look there. as nice as as it is to hear that people start tweeting the beginning of the show it kind of makes me feel insignificant when no. i send out a, a flaccid little no. bat signal that no. nobody's going to pay attention no. to because there's already so many tweets but whenever you want to tweet if you're watching this show <laughs> and you want to tweet on wednesday go ahead and start tweeting in for wednesday's show at collider video What's up first in the tweets that we probably got three months ago? <laughs> okay. Alex Anderson writes, if you could choose right now, who would you choose to play Wolverine after Hugh Jackman? I was actually thinking about this while we were talking about it because we haven't seen young Wolverine, right? I'm not just like forgetting that, right? It's just only Hugh Jackman in the movies, well, right? Well, you saw that. Didn't we see like a little kid Wolverine in, briefly in Origins, if I'm not mistaken? Oh uh, yeah, we don't really talk about yeah. that movie <laughs> at the dinner table, Dennis. So um, I I don't know who would be the right choice. It's the the biggest shoes to fill of probably of any character that's currently out there right now, wouldn't you think? So uh, w would you guys prefer to see somebody that you know? An, an actor that you're familiar with or someone that is a newcomer that we haven't seen a lot of before. That's exactly what I was going to say. I say you go newcomer. I say you go unknown. Well, Hugh Jackman was unknown when, when they cast him. For the him most in. part, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I personally think uh, Tom Hardy would make a great Wolverine just because I think he could get the feral, animalistic nature. If you saw Warrior, he kind of brought that across. I don't think he will be cast as Wolverine. They will definitely go younger. Yeah, I'm just starting to think of like the, the, the hairiest shorter stature actor in Hollywood. The only one I'm coming up with is Danny DeVito. So if you want to go with old man Logan after Hugh Jackman, Danny DeVito is definitely going to be the new Wolverine. I think they're going to want to skew younger, though. And Clark, I kind of agree with you when it's like, yeah, it should be somebody that's a little more unknown. As a play. I would I would not hate hearing that Tom Hardy's cast as Wolverine. I don't think that's going to happen. I think they would lean more towards having an unknown in there. All right, what's up next? Mikey freaking V writes, <laughs> what's the first movie you can remember watching as a kid? First oh. movie I can remember watching as a kid um, at home. I think it was probably Annie. 
was the first movie. I love that there's, Annie. there's actual footage in the, the Ellis family uh, tapes of me, my mom asking me, what movie do I want to watch? And she says, you can either watch Annie or Star Wars. And I was like, oh, Annie, it's a no brainer. <laughs> Good so choice. I chose Annie over Star Wars, <laughs> and uh, it's been held against me every time I go home ever since. Uh, the first movie I remember seeing in a theater, like actually experiencing for the first time in a movie theater, I think was either Flight of the Navigator, uh, the Transformers movie, or King Kong Lives. Oh, wow. All classics. How about you, Clark? I was, uh, well, there is also there is footage in the Wolf Family archives of uh, me uh, acting as Marty McFly, yeah. uh, performing at the Fish Under the Sea Dance. I know it's not called the Fish Under the Sea Dance, the Enchantment Under the Sea Dance, uh, with a little guitar rocking out to Johnny Be Good. Nice. So um, there's that. And also, I was all about uh, Ninja Turtles, the, the 90s movie, like the live action one. So there is also footage of a young April O'Neil in training. So did you place. have the bright yellow jacket? I, I think I probably did. And uh, and I was also, Wizard of Oz was is like my my thing like there's there's footage of me standing next to a giant television acting out the whole movie uh so yes yeah the wizard of Oz was also very big in my household growing up dennis the first movie you can remember experiencing uh empire strikes back in the theater mm. i just remember the ending traumatized me because i was i was like luke after i saw the movie i was like no can't be real <laughs> i'm in denial no it's not real it's not true do you wait? So you remember? Do you do you do you, do you remember sitting in the theater and hearing Darth Vader say those words? Yes. Wow. That's and awesome. it just like and it impacted you. And did you did you cry? How did you initially react to it? I mean, I was more in shock and in denial. Okay, but yeah. then later in Empire, Luke does when when Vader calls to him and he uses the Force telepathy or whatever. Luke responds by saying "Father." So it's kind of like Luke accepted it by the end of the movie. You not so much. No. No. <laughs> It seems like you still don't want to accept no, the Darth still, Vader. I still haven't accepted <laughs> still upset it. Still about it. Oh, okay, Ash, what is the first movie you ever remember watching? Um, probably at home. It was probably Aladdin at home. But in the theater, one that stuck with me and says a lot about my personality, I think, is Superstar with Molly oh, Shannon. I love that movie. Put them in a smell <laughs> like that. I love that movie. That is amazing. Um, I the, the the chat board's doing great. Uh, there's a lot of good ones up there. Some people are even going back all the way to the 70s when their first movie experience was Jaws. Mm. And it's like, what a great way to be introduced to a movie theater and you want to stay there and then never go in the ocean again. So nice kind of trade off. OK, what's up next? Uh, Mr. Yasman 300, Clark, you'll like this one. Thoughts on James Wan not directing The Conjuring 3 if it is greenlit because of his busy schedule? Yeah, for sure. Um, so we actually addressed this in our spoilers review of The Conjuring 2, which you can watch now on Collider Video. Um, and uh, I don't think James is gonna come back uh, for The Conjuring 3. I don't know if he's definitively said that he wouldn't come back. Uh, but I don't think he will. And so my pick for who I would like to take this over, and they're kind of in director's jail, essentially, <laughs> uh, but I believe in them, and I, I should have looked up their name since the last time we talked about this last <laughs> week, but I didn't. It's the directing duo who did Paranormal Activity 3. Ah. Um, the, I think that that movie has fabulous scares in it, but in addition, it's very heartfelt. It has um, great personal relationships between the adult characters and the children characters, and it's scary as hell. Also, a period piece takes place in the 1980s, so I think that those guys, if given the right opportunity, could really knock it out of the park. But unfortunately, I think James is done with the Conjuring franchise as a director. Well, that's a prospect that I find scary as hell, because <laughs> look, I like the Conjuring to a lot as a horror movie, but without James Wan directing it, that story really could have gone south fast. And it's because you had a master of storytelling, what James Wan has become somebody that clearly knows horror, but isn't always reticent to just do the cheap jump scare or the, the, the door slamming or a cat running across the screen. This guy knows how to really get in your head and scare you. So him leaving the Warrens when we might need him the most, because I don't know what story, I know the Warrens did a ton of investigations and they 
They went to a lot of different places all over the world to investigate paranormal stuff going on. If we've already had The Conjuring, which is a tremendous story, and we, then we went to Enfield and we did that, the, the most researched paranormal case in the history of paranormal cases, where are we going for in the third one? What's that story going to be? Is that going to be enough? Or are we going to need somebody else who's a master director to step up and weave this tapestry? A guy that I'm going to keep my eye on is David Sandberg, who did Lights Out. He did the short Lights Out that's going to scare the hell out of you. Then he's got the full-length movie that's produced by James Wan's production company. <clears throat> coming out later and so that's something that you know if that movie does well clark i think that he could be in line to maybe doing another contract well i may or may not have seen lights out last week <gasps> oh oh and wow. maybe you'll have to tune into collider nightmares to hear more oh, tease um but i think i think you're wise to think that sandberg is going to be in the family he is directing annabelle too they right, start produ right. production in two weeks on Annabelle 2, so it's coming up real fast. I had an opportunity to um, mingle a little bit with him at the at the premiere last week um, at the LA Film Festival, and uh, he's super jazzed. He's really jazzed for Annabelle, and I think Warner Brothers and New Line is going to hang on to him as long as possible. So you're absolutely, I think that's a very good guess. You gotta think some point down the road, Annabelle and Chucky are just gonna get it over <laughs> with and get together. In the meantime, Dennis, James Wan not doing Conjuring 3 in all likelihood. This is not official, but this no. is what he said, or he, he feels if it does get greenlit, where does that take the Conjuring franchise? Well, I don't think he is going to do it just because he's expressed interest in, he, he wants to do different genres. That's why he did Fury 7. He's doing mm -hmm. Aquaman. I think he kind of wants to do a variety of different films. I personally would like uh, Brad Anderson, the director of Session 9, one of my mm. favorite horror movies, mm -hmm. to do it. I actually like the movie he did uh, with Halle Berry, The Call. Mm. Very thriller aspects to it. I think he's a good filmmaker and maybe he could do Conjuring 3. Oh, okay, we'll have to wait and see. Ashley, do we have any more cool tweets? We sure do. Okay, LV426 writes, favorite movie about magic or magicians? Mine is Christopher Nolan's The Prestige. The Prestige Such a good one. is a is... great, great call. As far as magic and magicians go, uh, The Illusionist, uh, a little bit. I, I yeah. think I dug that one okay. The first Now You See Me I thought was okay. If we're talking about magicians and magic, though, don't you immediately jump to Harry Potter? Like, mm. those damn wizards can conjure anything they want, <laughs> and they're not relying on, like, gee, you know, like, like, you know, they're not doing Vegas tricks. They can actually cast spells and stuff. So you got to give them an advantage going into any battle of magic, whether it's physically going against wizards or it's like my movie's better than yours. I don't know what my favorite Harry Potter movie is because they all kind of blend together. I like Deathly Hell's Part 2 a lot. I just don't think that Voldemort came to play at the end of that. He didn't bring his A game. He was kind of like the Warriors sometimes. Why, it's why like, we're he, so good. Why did he hug Draco Malfoy? That, that was the, I, one of the most awkward <laughs> scenes. I was like... Why is this evil guy just like, oh, yeah, you came to my team and he gives him a hug. Yeah, like, the the what, guy's what got this? so much potential and he just sometimes he doesn't bring his all. Uh, Dennis, your favorite movie about magic or magician? I mean, it has to be The Prestige. I remember Illusionist came out actually at the around the same time as The Prestige, but The Prestige is the one that I like the most. I, it's actually not just one of my favorite magician movies. It's actually one of my favorite Nolan movies. I put it up there with... The Dark Knight and, and some of his other ones. Okay, Clark, you're famous for loving Burt Wonderstone. Defend your choice. <laughs> How kidding. dare you, Mark <laughs> Ellis? Although I did want Burt Wonderstone to be awesome. Oh, me too. I wanted it to be. I it. wanted it to be so good. Well, I know it's not a movie, but obviously Joe Bluth is one of my favorite magicians ever uh, from Arrested uh. Development. However, uh, and I love The Prestige as well. Um, probably my favorite Christopher Nolan movie, actually. Um, for magic, I would say uh, uh, The Witches of Eastwick. I think it's such an underrated movie. An incredible cast, all in their prime. Really really funny, really dark, really great. But in terms of magicians, a movie called Magic starring Anthony Hopkins, written by uh, William Goldman, um, which is this really effed up, dark, not really a horror movie, but Anthony Hopkins basically plays a crazy guy who has, I think he's a ventriloquist puppet, um, but it's really Ooh. weird and 70s and you should, maybe it's been the 80s, but watch it. It's called Magic with Anthony Hopkins. Okay, some other ones I'll throw out there. Uh, Tesla, which has David Bowie in it. Um, then you also have a movie that, it, like The Sorcerer's Apprentice, stuff like that, which was better than I thought it would be. 
That's saying something for Sorcerer's Apprentice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually enjoyed that movie. I right. will go on record. I will defend uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice for thank sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Magic, while sometimes creepy in person, is a lot of fun to experience on a movie screen because then you don't actually have to hang out with a magician afterwards. <laughs> I just, they, they, they freak me out, man. I want to go to the Magic Castle at some point in LA, but. Um, You've never been? Never been to the Magic it's nice. Castle. It's, it's cool. awesome. I hear good things. It's like a lot of different rooms and secret yeah. passageways. You know, stuff going on. Yeah, I, I, I have a feeling I'd walk in there then like they'd like lock me in the basement and never let me leave so <laughs> just a fear i have that you guys didn't need to hear about all right let's do one more twitter okay. question today. franco delgado writes hey guys what kind of movie do you prefer to see in 3d first than regular or vice versa um i prefer to ask somebody and say do i need to see this that's in it. 3d yeah. that's what i try to do and what we try to do in our schmoes reviews is like we'll give you the review of the movie then we also want to let you know like hey you don't need to pay the extra three or five bucks for the 3d glasses for this one but if it is an event movie and they're pushing the 3d I will want to see it in 3D first. I just, it's, it, that's how I saw Warcraft. Mm -hmm. I saw Warcraft in 3D and IMAX. And I thought that was the right way mm -hmm. to see Warcraft. I believe I saw Force Awakens once in 3D, not the, not at the premiere. And I don't think you needed to see Force Awakens in 3D necessarily. Um, but if it is like an avatar or something like that, something that really utilizes the technology, I want to see it in 3D, but by and large, I'll be fine with 2D and never needing to see it in 3D. How about you, Dennis? Yeah, if the filmmaker says that he specifically created scenes for 3D, then I want to see them like Avatar, uh, even mm -hmm. uh, Hugo by Martin Scorsese. Life of Pi, I thought was great in 3D, but it's not always necessary. It's the ones that like they're just post converting for you know, the additional dollars, that's the ones that I kind of stay away from. Right. Uh, Clark, are you a huge fan of 3D or not so much? Um, I think it depends, like you guys were saying. First of all, these babies are uh, pretty strong. Mm -hmm. And so glasses on my glasses, not my favorite thing. Um, in fact, I think it was during RoboCop. I, I watched it in 3D at the premiere and I almost got sick. Um, so it was just too much for me. Yeah. So, um, but I will say that animated movies, Paranorman, uh, Coraline, Hugo, like you mentioned, those are movies that I will absolutely plan to see in 3D. And when it comes to like, super, or Jungle Book um, was great in 3D, but when it comes to superhero movies, I can take it or leave it. I, I tend to do what you do and ask, do I need to see it in 3D? Yeah, I mean, I, I and, and you you bring up a great point about the glasses in particular is like it, it's got to be the right glasses. There's certain theaters that I'm aware of that I won't throw some names at people <laughs> that have the old school glasses still. But usually, if, like if I go to like an AMC, I know that they're gonna have the good glasses and they're gonna be comfortable. I used to wear glasses occasionally in high school. I went between them and contacts back and forth, then had the laser surgery and never blinked again. <laughs> I put those on, and if it's the small, cool glasses, and I can totally handle it for three hours if I need to. But if they have the big, clunky, like dental headgear feeling ones, I don't want those things in my life at all. I don't care how much I need to see the movie in 3D. All right, that is going to do it for today's episode of Collider Movie Talk. I want to thank everybody, both behind the camera and up here at the panel, joining me. Before we meet them one more time, I do want to remind everybody out there that this Friday, the Ultimate Schmodown, it's not the Ultimate Schmodown, it's the Movie Trivia Schmodown, where it does feel ultimate each and every week, particularly for these two competitors, because we have Gray Drake going up against Jason Inman. Now, Gray Drake is somebody who's been on the fringe of the top 10 for a while in this competition, and Jason is a newbie to some of you guys, but you guys have seen him do a lot of Collider projects. I believe he did a Collider after show. He's a huge comic book fan. He loves DC Comics in particular, so it's going to be a very interesting matchup to see which one of them might be able to crack the top 10. Check it out this Friday on Collider Video's YouTube channel right here. And without further ado, Mr. Dennis Zhang, where can the kids find you? Well, also another video that we're shooting today that will be released later this week is the Independence Day movie commentary yeah. i'm so mad that i did not get invited to do this if you want to stay longer and you know for no. the next couple now no. okay. <laughs> no. okay i know and i'm All not right. wanted <laughs> All right. um that will be up later this week we're shooting it today we'll figure out when wednesday maybe thursday we'll we'll put that up and you can follow me on twitter at think hero or instagram dennis.tzng 
I literally cannot wait to see Independence Day yet again. I've probably seen the movie a hundred times. Let's do it for the hundred and first time. But for the first time, I will be on camera and maybe attacked by other people watching it for the few plot holes that movie may or may not contain. No, there's Clark, no such thing. No, you love that movie as much as I do. Where else can people find you and tweet you their love for ID4? Indeed. Let's all talk about Independence Day anytime, any place. You can find me on the internet at Clark Wolf, Clark with an E, Wolf with an E, and every Tuesday here on Collider Video for Collider Nightmares. We've got a great show coming up for you guys tomorrow. The first original panel is coming back, and it's going to be a great day, so don't miss it. And Ashley, where can everybody find you on Twitter? They already know how to tweet Collider. You've made that yeah. abundantly clear. Where can they find well, Ashley Mova I want you guys to wish me luck because I'm going to go film a podcast or record a podcast with Christian right now. So I, I need luck for that. Yes. And you guys can find me on Twitter and on Instagram at Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. And you guys can follow Wendy Lee at Wendy Lee S. Zaney on Twitter. Make sure you guys check her out. Thanks for joining us today, Wendy. Thanks for having me. Lots of fun. The dog is napping. Everybody's wondering where the dog Why He's not here. He's on the floor sleeping. Does Falco or have like any social media handles because a lot of people a lot of times you'll you'll see an instagram account created just for the puppy is that going to be the case with you believe it or not he has one felcor felcor with a k underscore stagram <laughs> I don't know what that says for the future of our society, but I will definitely be checking out that Instagram. As for me, it's simply at Mark Ellis Live across all social media. This weekend, Southern California, I get to hang out and sleep in my own bed, but I will be at the Pasadena Ice House Comedy Club this Friday and Saturday. You can get tickets soon at MarkEllisLive.com. Thanks for joining us, guys. We'll see you tomorrow for Taco Tuesday. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.